Um, my name is Caroline Deneff. I'm the director here of the Analytical Resources Core, if we call it also the ARC. Um, and today I really wanted to give you kind of a high level overview of who we are, um, you know, what our equipment, uh, instruments and services and expertise and, and educational resources we have to offer all of you researchers here at CSU what they are and, um, you know, shed some light on some of the research that we enable. Quite a lot of people use the ARC, uh, lots of different diverse research programs at CSU to come to us. So I'm um, going to highlight a couple examples to give you a little bit more of an idea of what happens here and what people use our instruments for. Um, and then I thought I would also kind of give you some practical tools to really make the most out of the ARC. Um, you know, how you best communicate with us, how you can find our resources, um, learn more about them, uh, stay connected with us, how to engage with us, um, some tips and tricks. Uh, and then I thought um, I added also a couple slides for those of you who are new, um, but also those of you who use us on a daily basis. Some of the things you may not know about us. So um, just a couple interesting slides at the end. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the plan for today. And as Corey said, we're going to have every month one of our experts and staff members who are going to talk a little bit more in depth about um, their particular area of expertise and the services they offer and, and the instruments they maintain and and, um, um, and, and run with uh, to all of you in the coming months. So I'm going to stay away from those details and leave them up to the experts in the coming months. So um, I thought I would just start out with a little bit about myself. So um, most of you may know, but may maybe some of you don't. I'm, I was born and raised in Belgium, so uh, I'm a Belgian citizen. And um, I grew up in a town called Blondin, which is about a half hour from Brussels. And I went and did my undergraduate uh, in bioengineering at the University of Leuven, uh, which is kind of smack here in the center of Belgium in the Flemish part. So I speak Dutch, I also speak French and English. So when you live in Belgium, you have to learn a lot of languages to get around. Um, my focus in, in, uh, in my undergrad was on environmental engineering and uh, I continue on doing a PhD in bioengineering also at the University of Leuven, but I, I did my research actually here at CSU. I, I joined the Natural Resource Ecology Lab, also called the NREL, um, here at CSU and I, I worked on, um, I studied kind of the impact of agricultural and land management practices on carbon sequestration and biological, chemical, and physical mechanisms to stabilize soil organic matter in the soil uh, as a way to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and, and climate change. That was a pretty hot topic back then and still is. Um, and uh, I worked together with Johan Six and Keith Postian here at CSU and uh, had to go back to Belgium and defend my PhD there because I was on a Belgian fellowship. And then um, I, I went back to Belgium to do a postdoc at the University of Ghent in their Department of Physical Applied Physical Chemistry. And I started uh, working with isotope tracers and used a lot of mass spectrometry to look at how carbon flows through the soil and what kind of chemical compounds um, uh, the, the carbon actually becomes stabilized in and how it interacts with clay mineralogy. So I, I got exposed to, uh, in my postdoc, I actually was given a an analytical facility that had a lot of brand new mass spectrometry instruments and I was in charge of maintaining and, and finding research applications in my area of research, uh, kind of as a shared facility where I, I had to keep the instruments running, train users and actually develop a lot of research applications. So that was kind of my first introduction to shared core facilities, even though they didn't really call it a core back, back then um, and in that university, but I, I really loved the collaborative and interdisciplinary research uh, that took place in these facilities. And, and that's kind of where I started realizing this is really an area I like to move and continue in um, in terms of management shared uh, analytical facilities. So after that, I dabbled around a little bit in consulting. I moved to the private sector and um, did some climate change consulting for a company called ERM. Um, and then after that, came back to CSU and uh, joined um, joined the groups of Keith Posh and Francesca Cotrufo, um, had a bunch of different appointments at CSU. I just highlight them here. Uh, worked at the NREL as a research scientist, um, was involved in developing a core facility there called the EcoCore. Um, that's really a core facility that um, looks at or has instrumentation and services around um, elemental analysis of soils and plains and water and ecosystem science research that it mostly supports. Uh, and at that time, 
the CSU, the CSU course program was really starting to develop, received a lot of investment, and I was one of the people who um, started a, a new core facility called EcoCore over in NRL. Then I moved to chemistry in 2015, became a research scientist in another core facility back then called the Central Instrument Facility, which um, is part of the ARC right now, but um, that belonged to chemistry back then. Became the mass spec lab manager there and then um, got hired into an associate director position and then Back in 2020, um, the ARC was formed uh, out of a merger of three core facilities, including the CIF, and we moved under uh, the administration of the Office of the Vice President for Research, where we currently reside. And uh, I became the director of one of the three centers in the ARC, the ARC MMA, and then moved into um, an interim director position when our director retired. And now, um, since recently, I became uh, the director of the whole art facility. So that's kind of my path. Uh, I'm also affiliate faculty in a number of departments and programs, GDPE and chemistry, um, the Data Science Research Institute and the Water Center. So um, have lots of uh, different appointments I held at CSU in various different units. So had a, we'll see where we we'll end up next. <laughs> uh, hopefully I'll stay with the ARC for a long time. So um, my role as a director, uh, as you can see here in this picture, uh, I wish I had eight arms and perhaps eight clones, but uh, I, I do fill in a lot of roles. As a director, I'm in charge of management of our operations, budget, people. Um, I work a lot around fundraising to make sure we, we get investment in new equipment, uh, new staff that we have to bring in. Um, so lots of grant writing to, to bring in new equipment. When, when our equipment becomes outdated or becomes old. Work a lot around strategic planning of our core facility um, that involves thinking about staffing, our technology, staying state of the art and up to date, um, financial planning. I work a lot with customers and users, so there's a lot of customer relations involved in my job. Do a lot of HR, you know, hire, recruit, retain, promote people, make sure they have opportunities for professional development. I do a lot of marketing. Um, one of one of the seminar is one of those examples of making sure that there's some awareness and visibility around our, around our core. Involved in sales, I have to make sure we're compliant, um, that our data is um, reproducible and of high quality, so I have to work around quality assurance. Um, I oversee our training and outreach program, and I try to do a lot of learning, stay up to date with what's happening at CSU in terms of research and where research is headed so that we can remain relevant and that our core can continue to provide relevant services to the CSU research community. But to summarize it, I think most of my role is around making sure our core um, is sustainable and that we continue to innovate. And in order to do so, um, you know, there's I, I think there's four pillars that are critical to sustain a core like ours, and it is making sure that we have the right personnel in place ensuring that we have the right expertise and technical support in the core, um, that we have the right infrastructure, that we stay state of the art in terms of our space and, and instruments, uh, that we continue to get investment because it's very expensive to run a core like the ARC and um, it's hard to become self-sustained from just the income of our, our users. And so uh, we do get a lot of investment from different entities on campus like the OVPR, the colleges and departments grants and donations so that's that's definitely an important pillar for us to sustain and then and then also to make sure that we continue to be evaluated and that we continue to know what our users need through surveys and advising and evaluations we have an advisory board uh, we get input from our user groups and uh, lots of input from our oversight from the OVPR. Please interrupt me at any time if you have questions so happy to um, pause and take a minute to answer some questions. So what is the ARC? So we're actually a, a core facility and to be a CSU core facility, in my mind, it, it means four big key things. In the first place, we're a shared research resource. Um, you know, we have um, capabilities and expertise and instruments that are used by a number of, a large number of researcher, researchers. We have a broad impact that's pretty critical to be a core. We're not just a core that has an instrument that serves one PI. We really serve a large user base. Um, it's important for us to enable research. That's really our mission is to make sure that research can can move forward in new directions and that we enable that and that we nurture early discovery and experimentation. Um, and uh, we're also a place to learn. So CSU is an academic institution and 
education and teaching is a critical part of the, the mission of the university and we're a part of that. So the ARC is definitely a place where students and users can come and learn. Um, and um, I'll talk about each of these four points in a little bit more detail in the next couple slides. But we're also a team. We're a team of people um, who are not just experts in their fields and not just maintaining instruments and collecting data for you, but they're also here to help you and support your research um, and really give you the best possible experience in the ARC. So it's a wonderful team to work with. Um, so kind of a fun picture here of the whole group. Um, like I said, we're a unit in the OVPR. Um, that means we get a lot of administrative support from the Office of the Vice President for Research and a good chunk of investment to make sure that we can keep instruments up and running and have the right staff in place. Um, and we're one of many CSU cores, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, CSU has many cores, the ARC's not the only one, so it's a whole program that um, administers and, and maintains and supports these cores. Uh, what does it mean to be a shared research resource? So that means we provide access to um, analytical instruments and analytical capabilities and expertise that really exceed the normal resources of individual research programs. And we make those technologies and expertise available as a shared resource. So researchers like yourself can come to us, um, to the ARC for chemical and structural analysis of um, small molecules like metabolites or, or newly developed drugs, um, micromolecules like proteins or polymers, um, newly designed materials like coatings on medical devices or semiconductors that are used in solar cells, um, or they come to look at the chemical composition or morphology of functional materials, um, material surfaces through a variety of analytical technologies. We're a part service facility where our staff runs samples for you and delivers you the, the process data. We're also part training facility. Uh, so most of our instruments are um, frequently operated in self mode, as we call it, by researchers like you yourself. So we train the users to come here and operate independently the instruments they need for their research. This is a big slide with a lot of instruments. Don't ask me how much time I spend on this, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how much we manage here in ARC. We house and manage over 50 pieces of equipment, and most of them are highly sophisticated um, and fill various analytical needs. So these range from um, you know, NMRs um, to benchtop spectrometers to look at chemical analysis. We have your FDIR, UV vis formator. Uh, we have at least um, five NMRs here in the ARC. Uh, there's EPR, there's a variety of mass spectrometers, um, depending on the type of chemistry one wants to look at, uh, be it in liquid chromatography or GC for volatiles, MOLDI for macromolecules. Um, so with every mass spec, there's kind of a different application depending on the type of chemistry people want to look at. MPMS, PPMS, um, or for materials characterization, whole suite of instruments to look at um, surface chemistry and surface properties. We've got electron microscopy to look at um, high resolution imaging and, and analysis, and then uh, a number of X-ray diffractometers and scattering equipment um, to look at crystallography and phase analysis, polymer morphology, you name it. So it, there's a lot of equipment here and um, to properly manage that, we need a lot of staff. So we organize these services and instruments across three different centers. Um, we have the MMA Center, stands for Materials and Molecular Analysis. We have our ISS Center, um, stands for Imaging and Surface Science, and then a Bio Center, stands for Bioanalysis and Omics. In the ARC MMA, um, you can find the expertise around molecular structure elucidation, chemical elemental analysis, spin radical characterization, thermal, magnetic, electrical properties of materials, uh, large macromolecule characterization like polymers and proteins, um, and then um, our X-ray crystallography and diffraction um, division. In ARC ISS, you can find our expertise around um, high resolution imaging of structure and morphology of materials. Um, you can come to the ARC ISS for all kinds of ways to analyze the properties and chemistry of material surfaces. Um, and this center also has a whole suite of um, sample prep equipment for microscopy to prepare both hard and soft materials for, for good EM imaging. 
Um, and then ArcBio is really the center where you can find um, the expertise around quantitative and qualitative metabolomics, proteomics, um, something called metaproteomics, which is a pretty new area where people look at the proteomics um, of entire communities and the microbiome. You can come there for bacterial identification of isolates, DNA, adectomics, ionomics, which is the field of elemental composition of organisms. So all kinds of services we offer in these centers. And um, again, in the coming months, you'll hear more about these um, from all our different experts. This is our team. So we have lots of people uh, working in the ARC, all experts in their own areas. And um, they kind of are grouped here by, by the center, um, even though each of these centers has their own experts that work very closely together. Uh, the strength of ARC is really in the way we collaborate across disciplines and we bring in expertise from all kinds of areas to work on projects that require um, often multiple analytical approaches. So, so it's really nice in ARC that all these people kind of work very closely together. Um, we're all kind of close to each other uh, spatially in, in our offices and Often you'll find everybody just talking to each other, brainstorming over what analysis are best to, to um, serve certain projects that do cross discipline. So, um, so anyway, um, lots of people here. We've got myself here in MMA as the director of this center, Indrani, who manages our magnetics, EPR, and spectroscopy division. Alyssa May, she's a soft materials chemist. She's in charge of our MALDI. Um, we are hiring a, a person to fill a vacant position in X-ray diffraction and scattering. Um, so if you know of anybody, them apply. I think the, the search closes this end of this week. <laughs> um, Michelle Mayo, she uh, manages our NMR lab. Um, we've got Claudia Boot, who's in charge of our self-use mass spectrometry. Paul Matthews in charge of GCMS. Our ISS center has Roy Geis in charge of TEM. We've got Rebecca Miller in charge of SEM and surface analysis. And Bradley Williams, um, he's a GRA working with us to really develop better sample prep techniques and um, developing some new um, techniques in bio TEM. And then our um, ARC bio team is Corey, who um, introduced the seminar today. He's our bio director and does a lot of everything here in bio, proteomics, metabolomics, but he oversees a pretty big group of people, including Gustavo and Dora, who are in charge of, um, who are managing the proteomics division. Jackie, um, who manages our ICPMS and um, leads our ionomics division. Um, Claudia is actually part of this group as well, as she's really uh, developing self-use metabolomics workflows by using mass spec and NMR. Linkson um, is in charge of our targeted metabolomics, Nathan um, for untargeted metabolomics, and now we're hiring another person to help with sample prep because these are pretty labor intensive sample prep um, processes to fill uh, the needs of all these divisions. And so we're having an, an open search for that as well. Uh, again, most of these um, people will talk in the next couple of months about the technologies and services they oversee in the ARC. Um, so definitely stay tuned for more information about that. There's more information on our website and uh, typically they take place the first Wednesday of the month. So you can block that on your calendars every first Wednesday from two to three. There will be an ARC seminar. So it's a little overview of what to expect, um, but um, you'll see more information coming your way through our mailing list. So stay tuned. So as I said before, the ARC serves a really large and extremely diverse user group, mostly at CSU, but also outside of CSU. Um, and and uh, as you can see here in this table, um, in the last fiscal year, we received over 900 service and training requests just within CSU, so that's quite a lot. Um, we served over 260 pro research programs here at CSU from 118 principal investigators across 34 departments and units of 10 colleges um, and a, a total of 42 external for-profit companies and 17 external non-profit. Um, this map here is a map of the US that shows the total dollar value of our services across the US. You can see that a lot of institutions and companies all over the US actually come to us for analytical services. So we have a pretty broad reach in, um, in uh, name, I guess, and, and are known for um, the services that we provide. <clears throat> so part of our mission is to enable STEM research and development programs uh, and really nurture early stages of experimentation 
and discovery at CSU. And so the next few, few slides, I really want to show some examples of um, research that's uh, that was enabled by the ARC uh, through various instruments and technology the, the users and the researchers used here. And uh, I just want to highlight a couple publications that just recently were published um, from different research divisions and research groups here at CSU. Um, so this first one here is um, a work by the Nielsen Group here in the Department of Chemistry. Um, they really work on, especially in this particular paper, they work on um, developing new solar, solar cell materials that um, have specifically high power conversion efficiencies. And some of these materials, and if Jamie is in this audience, please <laughs> jump in if I say something wrong, but um, this is how I kind of interpreted the paper and looked at ways that the ARC really enabled this research. Um, so they, these materials are not always um, stable and they, they can undergo certain phase transitions in their um, crystal structures uh, that are triggered by um, water and light. And so it's very important that these materials can be stabilized um, uh, in order to really function well as uh, in solar cell applications. And that can be done through um, ion substitutions. And in this particular research project, uh, the Nielsen, Nielsen Group used um, solid state chemistry to integrate thiocyanate ions into the crystal structure of these solar cell material candidates. And they used single crystal XRD in ARC um, to really get detailed crystal structure analysis information um, that provided them with new insights that link the observed crystal lattice defects actually to the stability properties of these potential new solar cell materials. So pretty neat research where um, our single crystal XRD really helped uh, linking lattice information to the stability of uh, solar cell materials. The second example here is from the Kranz, Debbie Kranz's group in chemistry. Uh, she works a lot around um, synthetic chemistry for, for new drug development. In this particular case, um, they studied vanadium compounds and complexes as um, drug candidates for treating advanced brain tumors. Um, vanadium is a well-known transition metal and it's known for its anti-cancer properties. And uh, in this particular project, the Kranz group synthesized and used um, NMR and EPR in the ARC to characterize two new vanadium complexes. And they really um, they spent a lot of time on studying the effects of the chemical structure of these complexes and the effects on um, cellular uptake, cytotoxicity, redox chemistry, and hydrolytic stability, which are all really important factors for um, drug efficacy. A couple more examples. Um, here we have an example of uh, the Popat Group in Mechanical Engineering. Um, they really work on surface modifications of titanium orthopedic implants that are often used in hip and knee replacements as a way to reduce biofilm formation and the risk of um, post-operative infections. And they do this by modifying the, the surface topography and creating surfaces that really decrease the adhesion of bacteria. Um, and in this study, they fabricated these copper modified um, titanium nanotube surfaces and they used SEM in the arc to evaluate the morphology of the surface they used EDS and XPS to look at the surface chemistry. They looked um, at surface wettability by contact angle goniometry, and they used XRD to look at surface crystal crystallinity. Um, so some cool images here where you can kind of see how morphology was studied as well as uh, some of the copper integration in these nanotubes. Another example is from the Vulcans group here in mechanical engineering. Um, they basically developed this small monitor that you can wear called the air pen. And it's a monitor that people just can wear around in the spaces they occupy um, and work in, for example, to look at their exposure to particulate, particulate matter and um, volatile organic compounds such as benzenes and toluene and xylenes, all known to affect health and, and cause diseases. And this particular device contains a number of sensors to look at particulate matter, VOCs, temperature, humidity, you name it. Um, but they also have um, collection devices to collect the VOCs, the chemical compounds onto zorbin tubes that are then loaded on our GCMS here in the ARC to look at the chemical composition of the VOCs and quantify the exposure of individuals to individual compounds. So another uh, kind of neat example. And then one last example is um, from the Nachapa and Prenny groups in AgBio and 
horticulture and landscape architecture. They really look at pest biology and management. And in this particular study, um, the team um, looked at the biology and management of the hemp russet mite, which is um, kind of one of the more serious pests of the hemp plant. Um, and specifically in the study, they looked at the effect of hemp cannabinoids and sulfur treatments on the performance of this particular mite. And they used quantitative metabolomics assays in the ARC using our mass spectrometers and expertise of Lynx and Yao here in this picture to um, quantify levels of about 29 cannabinoids following the treatment of sulfur as a pest management strategy. So the outcome was really interesting because they noticed that hemp actually produces higher levels of cannabinoids following um, the reduction of mites by using sulfur. So just a couple examples to kind of highlight um, the research we enable. It's very broad, very diverse, crossing all kinds of disciplines and, and colleges uh, with all kinds of analytical technology. So. Uh, as I said, we're also a place to learn. So we provide um, education and training and outreach activities across a range of student and trainee levels in support of the learning and education mission of the university. A couple examples include um, our hands-on user training. So we train students on the instrument operation and data analysis um, for anybody who has a need to, um, to come and, and run samples in the facility. We receive on average about 40 new training requests every month. So that's a lot of training, um, but that's something we really enjoy doing. And it gives the students extremely um, great hands-on experience that um, becomes very valuable in their future careers. We also help out uh, with classroom uh, projects through demonstrations or training or even helping them at lab projects where the students have to solve problems for their class using analytical equipment. Um, we even have a virtual training program that we started since COVID where we had to develop SOP training videos and virtual learning through remote access tools. Uh, we still use that a little bit, um, but a lot of that happened under COVID where we had to make sure students continue to be trained um, in a remote way. <laughs> it's pretty challenging, but it was Quite, quite a lot of fun. Um, we sometimes have vendors who come in for a day to, to do demo days on new technology we're looking to acquire in ARC. And we, we typically invite students and researchers to come and try out the equipment and run some samples. Uh, we do quite a bit of K through 12 education. One example is our annual um, visit of some middle school students that are enrolled in the AVID program. And they come here for a couple hours to learn about chemistry and analytical tools and instruments. It's really fun to work with them. Um, we also have short courses throughout the year. Um, one that's upcoming right now in the fall is our TEM course that Roy Geis manages. And uh, Claudia Boot is actually developing a, a short course on self-use metabolomics. So stay tuned for that. And then we also, our staff actually is involved in a lot of in, in guest lectures in classes where um, the class has a need for a little bit more detailed overview and information about um, analytical instrumentation and technologies. Um, we're also a place where we, we, we are pretty proud of the professional development and workforce development that happens in the ARC. Um, we have a fellows program where we hire undergraduate student interns, uh, postdocs, uh, GRA support even for when we have some temporary staffing shortages and we um, are very grateful for working with various faculty to give us some time of a GRA to help us in these transition periods. But for the students and the postdocs um, and the undergraduate, it's extremely good hands on experience and learning that will be valuable as they move on to their next careers um, from the experience that they gain here in the ARC. Uh, we often hire postdocs uh, when we have NSF MRI funding for new equipment to bring in people to really develop research applications on new technology that comes into the ARC. Um, and we also get some undergraduate student interns through classes um, that are internship classes um, through chemistry. And actually, we have one student from uh, the journalism department who does an internship in the ARC to help us with marketing. As I said, we're one of many CSU cores. There are about 26 CSU cores listed on the OBPR website. You can take a look at them. Um, they're kind of grouped in different buckets. Uh, there's cores in science and engineering, uh, one of them being the ARC. Um, there's cores in computing, biological and clinical sciences, prototyping, 
Um, there's cores that are focused on statistics and help with data analysis. Um, we've got stock rooms and shops, and there's cores that are a little bit more focused around manufacturing of devices. Um, uh, and um, most of them are administered under academic colleges and departments with a few exceptions, like the ARC is actually administered under the Office of the Vice President for Research, same for our Lab Animal Resources Core, but all the others are kind of housed and homed um, under their own individual departments and, and colleges. So if you want more information on that, go take a look at this website and you'll see a whole list of them with all their websites. So next few flat slides, I really wanted to just provide you with some useful tools and resources that help you make the most out of the ARC in terms of, you know, how to find more information about our services and equipment, um, how to engage with us, where to request services, uh, how to navigate the, the dark world of iLab, for those of you who are familiar with iLab, um, and uh, how to stay informed. So. First place to go is our website. Um, the link is listed here. Uh, it has a little short kind of promotional introduction movie that you should watch. Uh, gives you a little bit of a glimpse of um, what we offer. There's, uh, you can look at all our services there. There's a searchable table of all our equipment. Um, our challenge is to keep it updated, <laughs> but we're doing our best to make sure that that's still um, up to date, but it's a table. You can type in GCMS and you'll find where that equipment lives and who the, the contact person for that is. Um, there's buttons here where you can search for equipment, request services and training, and a button for if you want to request a tour, let's say for incoming faculty or when you're recruiting faculty in your department, um, you can always request a tour, a tour for your class maybe. You can request some class support uh, through this link as well. Uh, there is also for, for faculty on this call or on this um, Teams meeting, there is a document listed on our website uh, for when you're writing grants and you need a facilities and infrastructure document. Try to keep that up to date as well. Um, you can download that and just use whatever you need for your, um, for your grant writing. Um, all our rates are listed there as well as who to contact. Um, we also have uh, an ARC user team in uh, Teams, and uh, for those of you who would like to, you know, stay more aware of some notifications around equipment, or those of you who are um, going to be using the ARC, it's really important to join that team. Um, we have about 519 members right now in there, and that's where all our new user onboarding happens. So um, basically, there's general information around um, how you get access to the lab, where to schedule services and, and time on calendars, uh, what our data management policies are, how to acknowledge us, um, how to stay informed, all that information is actually there, uh, how to request keycard access. So that's a good place for new users to go in and we usually tell them when they reach out to us to, to join the team. Um, all our safety and training videos and materials are there as well, our SOPs. Um, and we also have uh, an instrument status dashboard that lists all our equipment and what the status is. If it's down, if it's up, if it's down for a long time, where you can go um, here in the region for alternative options. Um, so that's a nice little resource that our staff tries to keep up to date as best as they can uh, whenever an instrument goes down and is under repair. So um, do check that out. Uh, you, you know, those of you who need services or have students who need to be trained, your first place to actually go is to register and create an account in iLab iLab is our core management software tool where we basically keep track uh, of um, all the instrument service requests or training requests, uh, where people find calendars to schedule time on instruments, uh, where people can come to request full service um, requests. So that's kind of the place to do that. We also use it for all our invoicing and billing because it's um, integrated with the CSU quality financial system. So when we bill and invoice CSU people, it hits immediately all the accounts after careful review. Um, but it's all kind of nicely automated in that regard. It's not the most user friendly tool, so you got to be a little bit patient with it. But we have some great support in case you have questions or you're struggling with something um, when you create a new account. Kathy Griffin is our business manager in ARC and she um, she handles kind of all the, the, the things related to ARC. Uh, related to iLab and uh, we have a generic email address for that or you can contact her directly. Um, but uh, yeah, if there's any issues around iLab um, or even with billing or invoicing questions, she's a person to contact. Oop. 
We also have a, a mailing list, so um, that's kind of a, a way for us to communicate with people around updates, um, things that happen in the ARC, upcoming seminars, workshops. We have a monthly newsletter, a monthly bulletin that gets sent out again with just things to, that we want to highlight that are happening here in the ARC, maybe new staff that was hired, people who are leaving, um, new equipment, new services that we're offering. So that's definitely a nice way to stay uh, informed. Um, and uh, yeah, you can join that listserv by clicking on this link or we can also put it in the chat. I'll make sure these slides are available to everybody so you can go back to them. <clears throat> We also have a YouTube channel. That might be something that everybody knows of. Um, that's where we store all our movies, our training movies, our seminar series recordings. They all go into this YouTube channel. Um, and so if you ever want to look back, uh, if you've been trained six months ago and you want to just kind of watch the movie again and refresh your memory, um, not all our equipment have training movies, but, but a lot of them do. Um, and all the seminars that you may have missed, you can find them back. Um, at least those of those of the seminars that um, we did record, you can find on this YouTube channel. And then you can come to the lab and pick up some flyers if you want to hand, hand them out to some incoming new faculty or graduate students. We have a whole table full of them and there is more to come. Um, so those you can find in the various labs um, where we're located. Where can you find us? We're located in a number of different buildings. So uh, in chemistry in the basement, we you can find our um, NMRs, our X-ray diffractometers, um, suite of materials analysis equipment, our spectroscopy, surface analysis, EPR and mass spec. Our self-use mass spec is all uh, located in chemistry. We have a number of NMRs and a single crystal XRD in the chemistry research building. Um, our uh, omics mass spec facility and our life sciences stockroom is in microbiology and the electron microscopy lab can be found in Yates. So um, these buildings are nicely close to each other. Um, so it's not that far uh, to go from one to the other, but you do have to walk a little bit if you're coming from the other side of campus. Um, but yeah, this is where we're located. And then I thought I would talk a little bit about a few things you may not know about the ARC. So first thing I want to highlight is that ARC has been participating in um, the CSU Green Labs program as part of our commitment to reduce our, envir our environmental footprints at CSU. And examples of initiatives we're involved in are um, we participate in the International My Green Lab certification. There's lots of labs here at CSU who are uh, participating in that. Uh, I think the ARC is the first core to participate in it. Um, and it comes with a number of um, initiatives that we undergo, one including um, participating in the International Lab Freezer Challenge. Um, we also participate in the Ultra Low Temperature Freezer Initiative, where we um, try to buy energy efficient um, freezers as alternatives to some of our not so energy efficient freezers. <laughs> um, we also work a lot around creating awareness amongst our staff and user. We're part of the Shut the Sash campaign. We do a lot of composting in, in our kitchens and uh, we try to uh, work on greener procurement uh, practices for consumables, equipment and detergents. Another thing that maybe not everybody is aware of is that we have a life sciences stockroom um, that basically sells molecular biology reagents, enzymes, media, all kinds of consumables to any CSU researcher who has a need for that. It's located in the microbiology building and the person who manages that is Chrissy Battaglia. Um, it's really nice. It's, you know, there's actually um, lots of great, um, you know, supplies that you can get there. Um, Chrissy also makes sure that she can do special orders if there are items that are not in stock get a lot of discounts, there's free shipping. Um, so lots of kind of financial benefits. And um, most of all, um, the stockroom takes care of all the orders uh, to place the orders and process them and build them directly. So it saves you a lot of time and money. So uh, do come check that out. Um, another thing you may not know is that uh, we started an annual electron microscopy imaging contest. Uh, we started this last year and we had a lot of submissions, some really cool imaging images that were created on our SEM and TEM and um, then we select the winner and they, they get a little plaque with their with their image um, printed a little bit bigger and on a nice on a nice frame. Um, we have a big poster that's hanging out hanging up in the Yates Hall outside of our electron microscopy lab so do check it out. Um, there's lots of um, great images and some that are 
perhaps a little bit modified, but kind of fun. <laughs> so all of you who are doing electromicroscopy, do tell your students um, to submit next year. We also have a quarterly user focus group. So um, that's basically an opportunity for students to participate in smaller groups uh, around specific technology to provide us with some feedback or to ask questions, things that are not working so well, things that they would like to see maybe done differently. Um, and it's really uh, organized by the lab manager um, to meet kind of in person or over teams with a smaller group of users to, to really look around ways to improve the daily operations of the facility or of their labs. Um, maybe you also don't really know how we acquire instruments, so I thought I would kind of show you a distribution of where we get our funding from. Most of our equipment is actually funded through federal grants, so we do spend a lot of time collaborating with faculty on writing instrument grants to NSF, NIH. Um, there's some faculty who have been pretty successful with getting instruments funded through their Keck grants, uh, that's foundation money. So that's about 50% of our um, equipment funding comes from that source. Um, we also um, get a lot of um, support from CSU, the OVPR, the colleges and departments that help us with um, acquiring equipment and, and helping to pay for them. Um, that could be sometimes for a startup of a new faculty or retention, um, but it could also be just uh, when we make a case that equipment is getting older and we need to replace it um, and, and try to get some some investment from the different parties and stakeholders on campus. Um, and then the ARC does have sometimes um, some, some, some funds available uh, to buy equipment ourselves or to buy it through lease programs. Um, our only kind of mechanism to do that is really through some, some, um, some of the additional money that we can keep in a savings account from doing external business. Um, so that's kind of a, a component of, of funding as well. And then we have a little bit of uh, foundation money, as I said, from, from foundation organizations like Kick. A couple other uh, announcements is this is pretty exciting. The ARC is getting a new SEM to replace our 20 year old SEM that we uh, currently try to keep up and running as best as we can, but it's starting to fail. Uh, it's one of the most heavily used instruments in the ARC. It's used by 46 PIs right now across 13 departments, and it's maxing out on capacity. So it's heavily subscribed. We're reaching easily 180 hours a month. So there is no other CM in a core facility at CSU. Um, in case this instrument dies, uh, we don't really have a backup. So it's really critical that we upgrade this and that um, that we make sure that we can continue to provide SEM services to CSU research groups. Um, the new system is a nice upgrade. Uh, actually, we'll have uh, very high resolution imaging, also comes with variable pressure, which will be extremely valuable for researchers looking at insulating samples like polymers, biological samples, um, ceramics, composites that are all, um, you know, harder to image under high, uh, high, high pressure. So variable pressure will be very, very beneficial to them. It will come with um, advanced EDS, EBSD, cathode luminescence detectors, um, and it will continue to provide lithography um, to, to users who need that. Uh, and it will also have a capability to transfer samples um, air-free, basically, to um, the SEM coming out of glove boxes, for example. This is super important for people working in battery research where, um, where um, uh, samples are extremely sensitive to air and water exposure, so that's kind of a new thing that we adding, we're adding. It's funded by the OVPR, and um, hopefully we can place the order pretty soon. Um, but in the meantime, uh, because these systems take a couple months to get here, um, one of our the vendor is actually offering a loaner to place here until the new system arrives. So hopefully we can get that loaner here in um, end of September to maybe mid October. So um, that will be nice. Uh, we're also trying to acquire some new equipment through proposal writing with NSF and NIH. Um, we're having some capacity uh, issues on the 400 NMRs, 400 megahertz NMRs. They're starting to reach um, capacity issues because there's just so much demand for running samples. So we're trying to add another one. Um, and then just some equipment that's becoming older and harder to maintain, um, lots of repairs needed. So it's time to upgrade. So we're trying to get a new XPS here, a new XRD and a new um, high field NMR that can also do solid state. 
um, and that's those are all proposal efforts that we're collaborating with faculty on um, to, to write these grants and get them submitted. Now, maybe one more um, kind of did you know slide on um, where our staff that leaves the ARC at some point after working here for many years, they do sometimes leave and and uh, look for other careers. And uh, I always say we, we kind of breed talent here and that's I think a, a thing for all for everybody here at CSU where we see people unfortunately leave at some point, but um, we're pretty proud that these these people gain expertise to actually end up at some pretty cool places. So this is just kind of an overview of where some of our staff that have left the ARC um, have ended up. And, um, you know, for for people who are looking to uh, work in core facilities, it's not it's not just a, a place where you're going to end your career. There's always other opportunities afterwards. And I, I think we can say that we provide those skills and, and tools to give people professional development that helps them in their future careers. Uh, and finally, we have an advisory board. So, um, you know, I always tell people come and talk to me if you have questions or concerns or things you just want to see change in the arc or things that just don't work for you. Um, but if that's hard for you to do, you can also um, reach out to our advisory board. These are faculty that represent all the different colleges that we serve. Um, they're also a, a great a, a great group to approach if, if you do want to bring something to my attention. Uh, we meet about quarterly. Um, that's at least the plan moving forward, but um, they help me with, um, you know, uh, discussions around strategic planning and, and um, any other support that I need to get um, some of the input from the faculty and stakeholders for. And then uh, finally, how to reach me. Um, I'd say you can always reach me through email. I'm very fast in Teams, so you can always send me a chat there. You can reach me by phone and my office is located in uh, in chemistry in the basement in uh, room C1F and come see me for anything general inquiries if you just want to you know talk about doing a tour for one of your new students or to get some help in a class that you're teaching um, if there's any complaints or disputes or you know kind of things you want to bring to my attention any help you need with grant support or collaborations where you need help from analytical experts. Um, and I'm uh, also very plugged in with our regional course network. So I, I do work closely with people at CU Boulder, at Mines, um, even in Wyoming, um, at Anschutz. And I do know a lot of the course directors there. So um, if we can't offer you certain technologies or, or expertise, I can always reach out to my network and see if any of them can help you out. So a couple of reminders. Uh, please use um, acknowledge us in your publications where you use data generated here. It's a great way for me and for our staff to look at papers uh, to kind of understand what's happening here and to learn a little bit more about your research. We ask people to do that by citing our um, RID. It's a unique number that uh, is unique to the ARC and we can easily find it back in the literature. Uh, you can follow us on LinkedIn. We have an ARC um, place there, so we try to post from time to time some useful information about things that are happening in the ARC and then join our mailing list. So uh, again, I'll make sure that these slides are available to you so you can scan the QR codes and um, join all of these places. And that's all I have. Any questions?